Good morning. Good morning. I'm Errol Crook. I'm uh, the Abraham A. Mitchell Professor and Chair of Internal Medicine at the University of South Alabama College of Medicine and also Director of the Center for Healthy Communities. And I will be presenting today with my colleague, Dr. Alan Perkins, who you'll see in a, in a bit, who's Chair of Department of Family Medicine. I thank you all for coming to uh, Med School Cafe. And, uh, we are going to be addressing a topic of <clears throat> precision medicine or personalized medicine today. Uh, we hope we'll make it a, perhaps a bit clearer and, and spurn some uh, questions that we'll be happy to take uh, as we go through the talk. So, uh, I'm a physician, an internist. I like to start things actually with a case. I'm teaching doctors. That's what we do. And so I have a 45-year-old who comes in for an annual visit with their primary care provider. Everything has been well over the last year. The only issue that the patient raises is that when checking their blood pressure at the grocery store and pharmacy over the last six months, it's been consistently read as high on the screen. It range from 140 to 150 millimeters mercury over 90 to 95 millimeters of mercury. The physical exam is normal except for blood pressure that is actually also elevated. <clears throat> and it was also around that number on three other me measurements during that, uh, that stay. Um, so the provider starts to discuss diet and exercise, uh, modifications to reduce blood pressure, uh, asks the patient to keep a blood pressure diary, and has the patient return in two weeks. And at that time, um, the blood pressure is still elevated two weeks later, and again, two to three weeks after that. And 90% of the blood pressure measurements over that period of time being taken at outpatient pharmacy and grocery stores was still elevated. So the uh, pa provider uh, discusses with the patient, the, the they say this person now has a diagnosis of hypertension, a high blood pressure, and they start talking about additional means to lower the blood pressure and they come to a mutual decision to uh, start blood pressure medication. So the question then becomes which medication do, does one start in this situation? And there are a lot of issues to uh, consider when selecting the right uh, blood pressure medication. So uh, other conditions that the patient may have, their age, their gender, gender, their ethnicity, the cost of the medication, their occupation. So why would I care about occupation? So if you're a truck driver and I give you a medicine that's going to make you pee in an hour and you have a four hour drive, you're not going to take your medication. Just one example, okay? Uh, side effects of the medication and, and, and geography. Where you live may have some impact on the medication that may work best for you and, and you have access to. So. Uh, these are a lot of considerations, some of which are biological, some of which are um, uh, going to be related to your social circumstance, and, uh, and, and some are going to be really uh, based upon personal preference. You know, some, what, what's a side effect to one person isn't necessarily a side effect to, to another. <clears throat> so when we are thinking about blood pressure medications, you notice I had ethnicity up there and it's actually in our uh, evidence-based uh, guidelines around which medications to start. And there are several classes of agents one may think about starting with, on anyone with regards to blood pressure medication. But in, in, in African Americans, the use of the drugs called uh, angiotensin converted enzyme inhibitors or ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers are not recommended as first-line agents if there isn't an, another indication for them. And the reason is, is because as a group, and I've underlined the word group there, African Americans are less likely to have quote unquote effective blood pressure lowering with those agents compared to other agents. And therefore, they are not considered first line agents to use in the African American population. So a colleague of mine at a previous institution and I worked together on a study that looked at an ACE inhibitor, quinapril, and its ability to lower blood pressure. And you have two sort of bell-shaped, classic bell-shaped curves there. And the top one is for 
uh, white participants in the trial and the bottom one is for African-American participants in the trial. And what you'll notice is that in both groups, many of the patients had their blood pressure lowered. So going to the right, when you see the positive numbers, that's the amount of blood pressure lowering one had. And there were patients who actually had their blood pressure go up on the medicine. Going to the left, those ne negative numbers means they did not lower blood pressure. Blood pressure went, went out. So the, the peaks of those two curves are a, a bit offset. You can see the bottom curve's peak is a little to the left of the top curve. So African Americans as a group did not get the same blood pressure lowering as whites did as a group. But there were clearly many African Americans who had way more blood pressure lowering than many of the whites and vice versa. So what we had have done is taken what's happened to a group of individuals and made it then, uh, it has evolved into a recommendation of how one um, will perhaps treat a patient. And so that brings into uh, the discussion regarding whether factors like ethnicity or something more specific is going to be more precise, if you will, for any individual patient. So. I think that slide shows we, everybody is much more alike than they are different. And you know, ethnicity, you know, whether you Caucasian, Hispanic, African American, what have you, is really a social construct, not a biological one. But we're making a biological decision based on social reasons. So we have these several questions here. Is there, is there a better way to determine what treatment is best for an individual patient? Is there a better way to determine which diseases for which an individual is at high risk? And is there a better way to determine if an individual will have side effect to or, or not respond to a particular medication? And that's ultimately what the goal is of personalized medicine or precision medicine, that we can, as providers, will have opportunities to make really individualized decisions that are precise to the person in front of us. And that takes into account um, not just their biological and genetic issues, but also their social issues and other circumstances in life. And that with that information, providers are able to uh, make precise decisions that are personalized to the individual. So with that as a sort of a backdrop and introduction as to what we're talking about with uh, personalized precision medicine, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna shift gears here and Give the reins over to Dr. Alan Perkins, who's our, as I said, Chair of Family Medicine here at the University of South Alabama. Focuses a lot on preventive health and health in the rural communities uh, around this state, and it has a long history here of developing doctors who go out and practice in the communities all over the state of Alabama and the Gulf Coast region in both urban and rural areas. So, Dr. Perkins. Good afternoon. Um, so, for those of you that uh, can't read this, uh, the woman who's in labor says, does it uh, hurt? Uh, the, the husband says, does it hurt? Can I get you a beer or something? It says, why no one uses mid-husbands. <laughs> um, so, what we're going to talk about first is where we use precision medicine now. How many of you guys have had children? Raise your hand. So, you, you used an element of precision medicine. You looked at somebody and you said, huh. I'd like to have children with this person. And, and the criteria used, I'm not going to ask, but, but I'm assuming that you used some criteria and that you made a, a conscious decision to, to have a baby with a person. You may not have, though. It turns out about half of all pregnancies in, in the United States are unintended. Um, and I see a lot of people clinically who I ask them, do you want to be pregnant? And they say no. And I ask them what form of birth control are you using? And they say none. And I ask them if they're sexually active, and they say yes. Then I go back again and say, do you want to be pregnant? Because if people are of childbearing age, they are going to have children if they're in a sexual relationship with, 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 a, somebody, with, a, with, a, with a male. 
And that's just the way it is. And so some of what we're doing for personalized medicine is trying to give people the best start that they can before, before, they, before, their, before conception, preconception. And I'm starting with this because we often don't think of this and we often don't consider what happens if somebody gets pregnant and they have a medical problem that's not being dealt with. If somebody gets pregnant and they've got a history of neural tube defects in their family and they're not taking the folic acid, which we know will prevent spina bifida. You know, so there's a lot of stuff that we can do today that you don't need to think about a whole lot, but you ought to think about it before you conceive. And so long acting birth control, which is, which is, which is a godsend for many people, is something that we all need to be aware of. And then people can make a decision about, yeah, I want to have a baby with this person. Very important. Think about it. Think about who you had a baby with and whether you do it again. Um, <laughs> part of our problem, and, and, and back, to, back to Errol's point, um, so we screen for, for high blood pressure. It is a, it is a, a, a commonly known fact that if we effectively treat high blood pressure, that people will have fewer strokes, fewer heart attacks, and live longer. Having said that, it's also a commonly known fact that many people that take blood pressure medicine would live just as long and have no strokes and no heart attacks whether or not they took the medicine. And that number is number needed to treat, and I'm not gonna go into that, but it turns out that there's a little bit more to, blood, to the blood pressure story than what, than what we all know. Don't stop taking your blood pressure medicine. Um, but we accept that blood pressure is a good thing to look for and to deal with because we know we have a treatment, we know we have an effective treatment, and we know that we can keep people from having strokes and heart attacks and dying early. There's a lot of stuff that it doesn't matter if we catch it early or not, or that if we can stop it from happening, that's probably better than catching it early because there's probably nothing that we can do if we catch it early that's going to change the outcome long term. And that's some of what precision medicine is, is, is struggling with right now, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we, as we get further down. But it's, if you know something, can you make a difference in where and what we do later on, or is it better not to know that? Um, you know, if we're screening, if we screen mom and dad, prospective mom and dad, for Huntington's chorea, for example. Huntington's chorea is a disease, it's a, it's, a, it's a debilitated progressive disease that occurs about the fourth, fifth decade of life. Are we gonna tell them not to have a child because that child might have a problem 50 years later? These are things that we're about to have to start to come to grips with, and we've come to grips with them now, some. We, we've got some some screening for Alzheimer's. Are we going to tell people not to have a child because they might get Alzheimer's 70 years down the road? These are weird things. And so that's some of what I'm going to talk about um, is, is what the impact of thinking about these things is going to have going down the road and what it is that you and your families need to think about as you go, go down the road and where we need to go as a society. And then, and then in the end, as, as Dr. Crook said, we're gonna talk about a little bit about how NIH is collecting information to try to help us to deal with this in a way that's different from 23andMe and, um, and Ancestry.com. And, and we're gonna talk about that at the end of this. As I said, hopefully before you had children, or hopefully before you have children, what you'll do is you'll have a conversation and you'll say, huh, you know, your aunt looks kind of funny. What, what does she have? <laughs> so, you may not, but, but that is something to consider. And, and 
ultimately what we do as physicians is we take that information and we convert it into, yeah, you need to have these tests done, or no, you don't have to have these tests done. But often we work with a limited set of information. And that limited set of information is one of two things. One is, if you've not had a child, then we don't know what your children are going to come out as. And so typically it's second children that we end up kind of, kind of doing screening for. And realistically, there's some way, you know, we probably need to look a little bit more carefully before, before conception, as I've talked about. Um, and it turns out that you can go backwards and kind of figure out, again, what, do, you know, what does your aunt have is something that, this is a germane question. You know, it is a, it, it is a, as we go further into this, it is kind of important to kind of think about what runs in families. Um, you know, to share a little bit, my wife uh, passed away of, uh, of heart disease at the age of 55. Um, and my children are, you know, are certainly getting, thinking about that and thinking about where that's going to lead them as they hit their 40s and 50s. Having that knowledge, what your parents died of, what your grandparents died of, what your siblings died of, is something, or, or have, is something that will help you to make a determination about whether or not, um, whether or not you need to think and do differently for the risk factors. Again, back to, back to Dr. Crook's example, if you have a family history of heart disease, you're probably going to think differently about what blood pressure medicine you're going to be on. If we could test for whether or not you're going to get that heart disease, you'd really think differently about what medication you're going to be on. Where we are right now is we're able to do the risk stratification, but we're not, we don't know enough to be able to say, yes, you're going to benefit from this medicine at this time. And that's kind of, but, but we're starting to learn some of that. Um, you know, uh, ethnicity, and I'll talk a little bit about that, you know, but, but there are things that run, that run in families and that run in groups and that you need to be aware of. But we need to be a little bit careful. We'll talk about that a little bit too. And then, and then what happens if you, if you find something? You know, what happens? Because we don't, we don't all interview our potential spouses with a, with a three-generation family tree. You're looking for different characteristics, typically. Um, but what happens if you find something? And what is it that you need to do? And there actually are genetic counselors that people can talk to to help to figure out what the risks are. Because the risks are not, you know, um, Gregor Mendel was the... Uh, was the father of modern genetics, and he was a monk who sat around and watched peas grow and discovered that some peas were, uh, were, were uh, shriveled up and some peas were round, and he cross-matched them and discovered that, uh, that you know, they, they went down from generation to generation. People aren't peas, it turns out. And, and it turns out that just because you've got, uh, you know, you've got a characteristic doesn't mean that, you're, that your child is going to have that characteristic. Um, so it's a lot more complex than, um, than Gregor Mendel uh, outlined with the peas. As Dr. Crook said, um, ethnicity is a construct. There are a lot of people in Mobile, Alabama who consider themselves to be African American who have an awful lot of Native American blood in them. And there's a lot of reasons for that. The main reason is that the Trail of Tears in the, in the late 1800s, uh, a bunch of people that were American Indian were forced to move to Oklahoma, North Carolina, somewhere else, and a bunch of people self-identified as, as black at the time were allowed to stay on their property. So there's a lot of people up in the northern part of this county who have a lot of Native American blood because that's, that's who they were, and that was where they were in the, in the late 1800s. Um, so just remember that, that there is a construct to what you consider yourself, a family story that may or may not be, be consistent with what your, your three-generation genogram is. Witness Elizabeth Warren. Um, <laughs> And then the other thing is, some people choose not to know, and that's what we're going to get into in a little bit, because it's going to become, it's going to become odd. You know, there was a thing, I didn't read the article, there was a thing uh, that came across the, the news 
um, yesterday about somebody suing their parents because they didn't, they didn't want to be born and their parents didn't ask their permission before they were born. Um, you know, as somebody who was, who was raised Catholic, you know, it was, it was, they told us that there were little souls waiting in heaven and that one specifically came down and it had nothing to do with the mom and the dad. Um, which probably explains the, uh, the teen pregnancy rate in, uh, in public uh, high school, in Catholic high schools, but that's another story. Um, the, um, but remember that right now you have a baby, you have a baby, and we deal with the consequences. If you go to the children's and women's over there and you look in the, in the, in the neonatal intensive care unit, there's a number of babies that were born early that we're paying a lot of money for that we probably could have predicted that they were gonna be born early and that we were gonna pay a lot of money for them. And right now, that's okay, that's what we do. If we start to get better at predicting, are we gonna hold people responsible? And that's what we're gonna, that's, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but that's something that we're gonna have to think about as this, as this moves forward, is what do we do with that information? And how do we, how do we deal with that information? And is there, you know, if there's a soul waiting to come down and, 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 and create a baby inside somebody, you know, and that soul happens to be very expensive, what are we gonna do? And then again, there's certain diseases that everybody is kind of at risk for that they, 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 they have a right to know about. Cystic fibrosis is, is, one, is just an example of one. Uh, CF is a, is a, is a very, um, it's, a, it's something that people have and you may have it run in your family and it's a, it's a lung disease in its worst form uh, that's a fairly significant severe lung disease um, and a lot of people, about 10% of people are carriers for it. Um, however, it's not necessarily that you're going to have the, bad, the worst form of lung disease if you happen to have a baby with a, with a CF gene, and there's a number of reasons for that. But the reality is it's one of the ones that's recommended that anybody that has a planned pregnancy be made aware of and be tested for um, uh, early in the pregnancy um, or be tested for as carriers prior to the pregnancy. And this is, again, this is how many, how the CF uh, gene runs. Um, beta thalassemia is one that's uh, more common in African Americans uh, and Mediterranean, people of Mediterranean descent. Sickle cell is, is one of a lot of interest from an ethical standpoint because it is very prevalent in the African American community. Um, and trait is basically, although some people have symptoms with trait, most people have sickle cell trait and don't know it, never know it unless they marry somebody else with sickle cell trait and have a, have a baby with, with sickle cell disease. And there is, there is very clear evidence that, that we as a society blame people for having a child with sickle cell disease and don't blame people for having a child with cystic fibrosis. And we're gonna have to start rethinking what happens with that as well because that's not right. And those are the things that that we need, that we're going to have to kind of think through as we get better than this. And now, sickle cell disease, we've had a screen for a long time. I mean, basically, you get a finger stick, and you can tell whether or not you have uh, you have the trait or the or the disease. And in fact, I had a professor in uh, in medical school who we were we were there was a grand rounds, and they they br would bring patients out, and they presented this patient with full blown sickle cell disease. And as they wheeled her out, the guy said, "Fortunately, there's a cure for this." And she wheeled out, she thought, great, I'm gonna be cured. And it turned out, he was talking about sterilization of all people with sickle cell trait. Um, we've come a long way, that was the mid 80s, um, but there's still, there is gonna be a lot of controversy as this, as this moves forward. So again, genetic discussion is something that people need to, um, Need to, need to think about. Now, we're starting, and, and y'all, those of you that saw the news, in China, they actually have taken embryos out and taken, taken out dis defective genes and replaced them, or gene genes and replaced them. And we don't know exactly what genes they took out, and we don't know exactly how they replaced them, and we know that that guy got censured by, by a lot of people. But those are the types of things, because right now sickle cell disease is an example. 
is you can, you can, if it's detected prior to birth and the, and the child is born, then you can actually use some techniques to try to, to, try to change the, um, try to change the blood producing so that the child no longer produces uh, sickle cells. But to do that, you have to expose the child to significant risk of death. Um, and so, and, and a lot of people with sickle disease, they have pain crisis every, every year to, you know, every six months. And other than that, they work and live a long, happy, healthy life just like, just like all of us. So the question is, do you expose your child to the risk of death in the hopes of preventing a, 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 a severe form of disease? And that's, that's, a, that's a question that a lot of parents think about a lot. It may be that we're going to be able to do things pre-implantation, use IVF and make some changes, uh, but that's also very controversial. So these are things that people are going are gonna, to are gonna be thinking about and talking about. Um, other odd things, and, and the children of sperm donors is really odd, and I don't know if, if anyone in this room is or... Or, or had a child conceived with a sperm donor, it turns out that in the United States that the, that the, that the fertility uh, um, clinics that, that utilize sperm donors are for profit, as opposed to other countries where they're not. In other countries, basically after 10, after 10 children, they'll throw the sperm away and that person's no longer eligible to be a sperm donor. In the United States, there's attractive, smart people that made their money in college uh, giving, their, giving of their sperm. And there are 50, 60 children that are in multiple states because the sperm is like shipped all around that will be, that will be children of this sperm donor. And, you know, again, what attracts you to your potential mate? Well, if somebody is kind of like you, hey, let's go out. And all of a sudden, you, you might realize that you have the same daddy, <laughs> which has happened. So that's something that that as we kind of you know that that as we kind of think about things, we're going to have to kind of you know people you know again counseling for for prospective patients is that well if, if you are a child of a of a sperm donor or or an egg donor as is your, your potential spouse, you may want to think of, you may want to look, and you can actually get a number, there's numbers that they have, so you can find out who, what number you had. Um, you know, disability rights, you know, there are, um, how many of you guys uh, were aware of cochlear implants for, deaf, for congenital deafness? The community of deaf individuals fought very hard against that because they felt like it was discriminatory against their community. And so they, because they felt that, that, that the deaf community was a community that needed to be protected. Um, Down syndrome. Um, the number of babies that are brought to term that have Down syndrome is, is vanishingly small. It's less than 5% of all babies that are born with, that are, that are conceived with Down syndrome. And there's, a, and there's an argument by, by disability rights advocates that we need to stop people from knowing some of these things because they're making decisions that are that are discriminatory against the potential against the potential life. Um, certain populations have significant disease burdens, and it's something that 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 is potentially screened for to kind of reduce. So the the Jewish population, for example, has a significant disease burden. Uh, for uh, Tay-Sachs disease, and they'll screen in high schools and let people know if they have uh, if they have the genetic trait for that, uh, or in Jewish school. Um, beta thalassemia is another in Mediterranean areas that has a high disease burden, so they'll screen for that. Um, you know, they'll go looking for community carriers, and again, sickle cell was one of those that that in the 1980s they were they were screening people for sickle cell to try to identify have have people identify so they could fall in love and marry not the other person that had sickle cell. And the thing that always rears its head that concerns me a lot is, is eugenics. It is, it is trying to make for a better society. And, and we need to 
be ever vigilant because it's not like that's not within the human capacity to do that. Um, but we need to be aware that that is that that's something that can possibly be on the um, on the radar. Is how can we how can we prevent disease, make people smarter, make people blonder, you know, make people make people's eyes bluer. And is there are there things that um, that that we can do for that? And that is something that that's that always worries me. There is a, a law. It's called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. It turns out that if you have your genome done, that they can't discriminate against you only for employment and health insurance. Turns out that everything else. They can, they can ask, they can identify information, and they can stop you from getting, from getting life insurance if you have Huntington's Korea and know that you have Huntington's Korea and they find out you have Huntington's Korea. You know, so there's, there's, there's a law, but the law is nowhere near as inclusive as it needs to be for the direction that this is going in. So, I've scared you. Made you, made you think some. Um, you know, so, so if you're thinking about having a baby or you, you've got a, a child or a grandchild thinking about having a baby, who, who needs to worry? Well, the answer is, again, if you go backwards and say, oh, this runs in my family, you may want to talk to somebody. If you've had multiple pregnancy losses, that is early, especially early in the pregnancy, that's possibly a genetic, uh, a genetic problem and needs to be looked at. Um, if you had a child with a known, known inheritable disorder of birth defect, a uh, woman who is becoming pregnant after age 35, and again, that's the risk of Down syndrome, um, and other, some other uh, um, trisomies, but mostly Down. And it turns out that the father contributes to Down syndrome, as well. the age of the father contributes to Down syndrome as well. Um, increased risk of passing on a genetic disorder from the ethnic background is listed as one of the things, as Dr. Crook and I discussed, ethnicity is a construct. Um, and again, people that are consanguineous. Turns out consang consanguinity is not nearly as bad as we think it is, you know. Um, I, you know, there's, there are a lot of Alabama jokes that involve the term daddy uncle. Um, <laughs> but it turns out that, that there is very little disease transmission through consanguinity unless it's multiple generations down, and that's where it tends to magnify. So that's why the um, hemophilias and other, other inherited uh, blood, dis blood disorders in royal families is because they were completely inbred for, for five, six, seven generations. The Down syndrome, you said it also the male has... There's, apparently there's a contribution. Right. Is it age-related? It's age-related. Oh, it's, okay. it's age-related. Um, again, what does the genetic counselor do? Mostly says, yeah, this is what is likely to happen and does it based on probabilities. Um, and then it may say this is likely not to happen, which is a much better thing and you're gonna spend a lot less time worrying about it. Um, and then again, figuring out if there's gonna be a problem, how to, how to deal with that problem. So that's what a genetic counselor does. So I'm gonna switch gears, a l well, Switch gears a little bit and talk about the fact that most of the stuff that we believe is, again, is genetic. It's probably genetic. My children are at risk for heart disease. But their risk is not one in two. Their risk, it turns out, is much, much less than one in two because it turns out that there's a number, a myriad of genes associated with heart disease in women that all have to kind of hit on the right. It's, it's like a combination lock. That, that, you know, that, that has eight numbers, and you gotta get all eight of them right to be able to unlock the lock. If you only have seven of eight, then the lock doesn't unlock. And it turns out that there's a lot of stuff that that's the way it is. Um, you know, I mean, uh, looking around the room, one in four of you could get diabetes. Just about guarantee it. But for you to get diabetes, you'd have to gain weight, you'd have to, there's some things that, there's a lot of stuff that would have to happen for it to, for it to come out that way. And so the reality is, one in four of you almost certainly will not get diabetes, one in 10 of you will. Um, and if you're at risk or have a family history, you need to be screened. But one in four of you are not gonna get diabetes. Um, but what we know is that a lot of things are markers for, for complex disease, and we're gonna be tracking that through, but we know we also need a lot more information, and that's what, we're gonna, that's what Dr. Crook uh, will talk about at the end of this. 
this is what a genogram is. This, this shows you, so you mark who's dead, who's not dead, um, what diseases they have, and where you stand in this. Um, and uh, you get to put a slash through your ex-husband, which... Um, <laughs> Um, so what you're going to need to do this type of thing is you need to know names, backgrounds, ethnicity, um, family origin, health status, which includes medical conditions that ages at diagnosis, age at death and causes of death of each deceased family member, um, and then pregnancy outcomes of the patient and genetically related relatives. And it turns out that the federal government has actually put together a nice, uh, a nice tool for you to use uh, to go through and do that. And I advise you, if you just Google My Family Health Portrait, um, it allows you to, um, to put all your information in there, and it's, it's, it's not going to go to the government. It it's allows you to get a printout and to save it and for yourself. Now, it doesn't go anywhere, so don't worry about that. It's not Big Brother collecting information. Um, but it allows you to have a conversation. The recommendation is to do this around uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas when your family's there, and it allows you to have a conversation, especially folks that... Um, you know, if you have three generations or lucky enough to have three generations in the house, it really does help to talk about, about grandma and, and, and what she had and where she lived. And, and, and the kids will love it and they will, they will enjoy having that conversation. And then, like I said, it turns out that genetics is not like, like, like Gregor Mendel and the peas. It turns out there's a lot of stuff. So, so so ethnicity is a construct. However, people in this country that self-identify as African American die earlier than people in this country that self-identify as white. People in a given, in a given census tract that self-identify as African American die earlier than people in a given census tract that self-identify as white. And it doesn't matter what their genetics look like. It's the fact that they have lived as an African-American that makes them die earlier. And that is going to end up being what we call epigenetics. It turns out that your genetics, and again, back to, uh, back to Darwin, who believed that, 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 that genetics are everything, and there was a guy named Lamarck that lost the battle, who believed that your environment contributed. So it turns out Lamarck was probably kind of right that there's environmental factors that affect your genetics. And they not, and, and, and what we know, so what we know, for example, for those of you that are old enough and re remember DES, um, what we know is that if you took DES, your child was at risk for vaginal carcinoma and your grandchild was at risk for, for vaginal carcinoma. So it changed the genes two generations down. So we know that there are things that change genes that we, that we don't know how they do it or what they do it, but what we know is that it's gonna make you live, live not so long, or live longer, and it's gonna make you, make you be different. And that's kind of where things are going right now. That's more of the cutting edge, is how do we, how do we fix that? How do we get, make it so that people are able to live longer and better? Because they're being exposed to stuff, you know, chemicals, again, DES being one. You know, drugs of abuse goes down. Uh, financial status, it turns out, is a marker. So there's a lot of things that are markers. And so the question is, how do we know, how do we know what it is we need, to, we need to worry about? And how do we mitigate that? And that's, that's where... Um, you know, there's a, there's a term, the social determinants of health, that's, that's in vogue right now. And what that does is that talks about the 90% the of stuff that happens to you that's not doctor's visits that affects your, 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 your health. And the way it probably does it in part is through epigenetics. And so those are things, so things like not having adequate transportation, things like not having adequate finances, things like not having adequate food, not having adequate housing, uh, uh, systemic, uh, um, systemic uh, racial, um, you know, racial uh, issues, those types of things, uh, discrimination, those types of things, it turns out, affect your genes. We don't know how. 
we actually may be on the front of figuring some of that out, and that's part of what we're going to talk about a little bit later on today. And then what I'm going to do is finish up um, with a little bit of um, direct consumer testing, a little bit about that. Um, and then, um, so y'all all see the ads. You buy somebody a 23andMe for Christmas or your birthday or whatever. It turns out that you can find out a lot of information about yourself. You can find out if you've got, and these are the list of diseases, uh, just to kind of, uh, it should be G6PD. Let me get O in there. Um, that 23andMe screens for. Um, and they tell you whether you're increased risk for asthma, breast ovarian cancer, diabetes, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, it tells you currently whether you're a carrier for the BRCA1 and 2 gene, which puts you at increased risk for breast cancer, but doesn't tell you you're going to have breast cancer. So you shouldn't go out and get a, a bilateral mastectomy because of the 23andMe which is part of the problem. And then there's some other genetic things. And it will tell you whether or not a drug is going to work for you or whether or not a drug won't work for you. And, it, and it's identified some traits. I had a friend of mine um, when I was growing up who would always sneeze uh, when he got in the sun. And it turns out that's a genetic thing. It turns out that that's what 23andMe, that's their one big discovery is that, uh, that that's a genetic thing. Um, it also turns out that again, that, 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 that genetics is not destiny. That there's a lot of other stuff that play into that. You know, the for example is, um, and then there's a different example, but, um, but how many of you guys had a Fitbit? Anybody? A couple of people. Um, so it turns out, they did studies on the Fitbit. I mean, it turns out that people that have Fitbits gained weight over the period of time that they had the Fitbits <laughs> because it turned out that what they did is they said, oh, I burned 300 calories and they ate 400 calories worth of, of, of whatever. In the same way, what people do with this is they say, oh, I'm not at risk for diabetes. And so, kaboom, they're, they're enjoying the, uh, the lemon squares, uh, you know, they're, they're having a, a lunch of lemon squares without the salad. Um, so, so, so it turns out that, that, that it's not going to be, it's not the be all and end all. And then the other thing is it turns out that the information that they're testing for is, may not be exactly the right information. Um, like I said, Fitbit, the Fitbit example, we don't know if people think these are valuable and helpful. I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, as a physician, nobody's brought me a 23andMe and said, this is what my 23andMe says. You know, I'll just tell you that right now, um, that they don't, they're not bringing them into, into the exam room, and they're not telling us, yeah, I mean, this, I need to do this because I'll say that, I say that. Every now and again, you'll get somebody that will say, you know, do I need to worry about this? There is a labeling phenomena that, that, that happens in medicine. So if I tell you you've got the trait for high blood pressure, you're going you're gonna to feel less well than if I don't tell you you have the trait for high blood pressure. And you don't have high blood pressure. Um, and we're going to have to figure out how to deal with that. And then again, the other thing is, you know, if you get told you have BRCA1, or two, are you going to have a mastectomy and a, and a hysterectomy and not be at risk for anything because it turns out it wasn't the right BRCA1? Because there are doctors that'll do it. I mean, in fact, you know, for those of you that were fans of, uh, of MTV or VH1, I forget, um, the best show they had was the one where, where you would go and look like your favorite celebrity by having plastic surgery. Uh, and there were doctors that were turning people into Pamela Anderson all the time. Um, so, you know, just kind of, kind of remember that just because a doctor says he's going to do it doesn't mean that it's, that it doesn't mean all the time that it's the right thing to do. Um, and again, turns out, I don't know if y'all, everybody heard about the East, the East Area Rapist that was in California? Um, they found the dude from Ancestry.com. 
they actually had DNA and they went to Ancestry.com and went and kind of backwards it and backed into the guy and arrested him. Um, and so just because you didn't, and he didn't go to 23andMe, just because you didn't give your information doesn't mean that other people can't get your information. 23andMe, it turns out, is not in the business of selling DNA kits. They're in the business of selling DNA information. When you do that, when you send in your 23andMe kit, they keep your information, and then they send surveys out about wh what happened to you next. And they're using that, and it's owned in part, I believe, by GSK, is that right? It's owned by somebody. It's owned by one of the drug companies. Um, so it turns out they're using it to basically develop as drug development. So that they can then, they'll then, you know, when they find out, you know, what disease you have and what drug they've developed, they'll send you an email and say, by the way, for $5,000, I will, um, I'll give you the cure for the disease that you didn't even know you had. Um, <laughs> so um, it turns out that, that some genetic material is very specific. It turns out that on the Y chromosome that there is some incredibly specific information that you can use to guess somebody's name, surname. Um, and then again, right now the information, the, 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 the laws are not sufficient to protect people. Will we pass better laws to protect people once this information gets out? Great. So uh, we're going to wind up here in the next uh, two or three minutes and uh, then have time for questions. Um, William Osler is a famous physician, actually some would say the father of internal medicine at Johns Hopkins. Johns Hopkins. He says it's much more important to know what sort of a patient has a disease than what sort of a disease a patient has. So as, again, getting back to ultimately what we we're talking about uh, with having personalized and precision medicines to understand a whole lot more about the patient and then uh, moving forward to the best treatment or prevention strategies as Dr. Uh, Perkins outlined. And so uh, your federal dollars are at work for us to actually gain this information. You want to may ask yourself, how did Ancestry.com and 23andMe get their information, their databases. Well, they actually got it from the Human Genome Project. That was again, started in the 1990s and led by Francis Collins, where we were able to finally sequence the entire genome of an individual. I think that, that individual, that first genome was a postdoc in a laboratory. And what we've learned over time is that, you know, that while there are, quite frankly, you know, well over 90% similarities, there are significant differences from one person to the next. So we've, it's important that we've sequenced other, other genomes. <clears throat> In order for us to be able to make the correlation between uh, a gene that we know now and the likelihood of having a disease or a uh, side effect of a medication requires lots of data. And the All of Us research program is one of those programs that's going to be focused on expanding our knowledge and uh, with the ultimate goal of getting all of us, when you say all of us, meaning the entire population of the U.S. involved and represented, uh, with goals to have a million people uh, enrolled and being able to sequence all of those genomes and being able to get all of their uh, health outcomes going forward and backwards and maybe even fam and family histories, and then be able to make those correlations that one can do with big data. So this talks about precision medicine and, and, what, we approach and what we've chatted about already. Uh, it will be a radical shift, and now each of us receives the best care that we get and that we do things more on precise data about the individual as opposed to uh, likelihoods based on your age group, your ethnicity, where you're living, what your occupation was, and what your family history was thought to be or is. Um, so it launched in uh, 2015, as you can imagine, an effort to um, recruit a million participants is very Herculean. It has not been done uh, in this manner ever, ever before. And uh, they're looking to be able to, to um, 
basically allow providers to work together to develop individualized care uh, on every single patient that they see going forward. <clears throat> so, um, we're looking for one million participants that reflect the broad diversity of the United States. And uh, as uh, many of the folks involved with this and this development are younger than people like me and are really tech savvy, a large part of this is actually uh, um, technology based and allows the participants to both interact with the, with the study, uh, to give information as well as take information from it, would allow it to really be a living database for quite some time uh, to come. Um, so the, um, Dr. Perkins started bringing up issues of privacy and trust that are big issues when we start thinking about uh, our personal information, particularly things around our, our genetics. The All of Us Project will actually uh, sequence the entire genome of all one million people. And that's something that's actually readily able to be done now. It doesn't take five years to do it. We can do it on, on everybody now. That's a bit different than what you'll see with 23andMe and Ancestry.com that actually just do pieces uh, of, of the genome. We do the entire genome so we can learn about uh, all those parts of the genome that have some association with uh, uh, potential disease or, or prevention of disease, et cetera. And the information will be uh, following, following you forward, the information really comes out of electronic health records. So it's been really a uh, revolution in health records now. Um, no more illegible notes by people like me. Uh, now they're, they may not make much sense because we can't type or <coughs> dictate well, but uh, the data is there. There are ways to pull that data out of the health record going forward to see what health traits are associated with which parts of so, someone's genome, and if that correlation is there in another two or 300,000 people, then maybe we have something that we'll call actionable. So at, the po at this point, as Dr. Uh, Perkins outlined, there are approximately 25 actionable genes that are identified. We know that there are a lot more out there that need to be identified, and the All of Us project is um, the biggest effort to go about identification of those actionable items and allow us to actually go uh, pursue and deliver precision medicine going forward. Uh, we actually have our table here to uh, my right, and that Mr. Marcellus Hudson, one of our employees, is here. To, we have information about it. You could actually enroll today if one would like, uh, but we're for, here to answer questions about it and the topic in general. So it's one of those things where I guess we say the future is now. Uh, the pace of technology has quickened considerably and to think about the fact that the Human Genome Project is really just about 20 years old and now we have commercial products like Ancestry.com and 23andMe that are out there that can relay a lot of information that in some cases turns people's lives uh, on his head at times. Um, and but the opportunity for us to go further is clearly there. The issues of privacy and trust and data security are uh, with uh, all of us are uh, paramount and being uh, uh, always put in the forefront so that security is going to be maintained uh, through as many mechanisms as possible. And I believe um, that's all I have to say at this point, and we'll have time now for Dr. Perkins and I to uh, answer questions that you guys may have. From a, from a, as a clinician, how, when you have a patient that has, well, let me start from an environmental perspective. Like, um, if you have such widespread exposure to something like recently, the uh, perfluorinated chemicals like C8 and Teflon, it, Pretty much the world is exposed to now. It's been attributed to birth defects and that sort of thing. As a clinician, how do you account? How do you accurately account for something that is so pervasive across geography, uh, racial backgrounds, that sort of thing? <clears throat> when, when you're when you're looking at other problems, how do you fit that into the equation? I mean, the, the the question is how do you how do you take into account all the epigenetic 
possibilities as you deal with an individual patient? And the answer is right now you don't. The answer is right now you would, you would, what we do as clinicians right now is you play probabilities. And like I said, the probability is one in four of you could develop diabetes. The reality is it's one in 10. Um, the probability for a lot of environmental exposures is one in 100,000 will develop a problem, but, but 999 out of 100,000 won't. So you end up dealing with, with probabilities, and then what you end up doing in the end, from an epidemiologic standpoint, is you would then think about, is it that we're seeing problems in this group of people because of an exposure, or is it random chance, or is it a surveillance problem? So the example is uh, commonly, there's, there's what they call cancer clusters. Um, Louisiana, where I'm from, has and has had a lot of cancer clusters, and I actually studied uh, public health in, uh, in medical school. Um, and they would go out and try to determine whether or not there was environmental, uh, environmental uh, cause for those ca cancer clusters. And almost always they found no, that it was, it was uh, surveillance. They, people were looking for them and that it was, a, it was just a, it was a, a, a random cluster. Asthma, there was a, a, a community in, uh, there was a community in, uh, in, in San Francisco that suffered, the children suffered uh, from a high rate of asthma. And the community, it's uh, 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 Barber's Point, the community was convinced that it was, uh, m that it was stuff that came from an old uh, a fuel depot on an old uh, military base, Barber's Point. The reality was all of the children had bad asthma. Their parents smoked like chimneys. But you couldn't convince them of that. And so that's kind of how you do, is you, you play the odds and you, and you figure it out. And then and you have an open mind to, uh, could it be a something? Thanks. Other questions? Other questions? Comments? Yes, Ashley. So with the, um, all of us program with the federal government pushing that out to enroll a million people, how do you, once this is done and they, they do the DNA genome on everything they have in their database, what, what do you see as the future of medicine as far as how far down the road and pinpointing certain disease traits or markers <coughs> for someone? So the question is, uh, so sort of taking a future look at the impact of all of us and on, particularly on patient care. So, um, you know, as I said, all of us is really a, a huge effort, a million people, all of their health information. So it's really the epitome of uh, big data. Uh, it increases the power in, uh, of genetic studies when you have more people to find particular genes that may be associated with a specific condition. So one would expect that there are going to be some things out there, sun sneezing might be an example, that we can find a gene or one or two genes that are associated with that. May or may not be public health problems when you find those things. Uh, as Dr. Perkins pointed out, on diseases that are much larger issues for us, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, um, cancer even, in many cases these are what we call multigenic, polygenic disorders, so it's a cluster of genes and it could be any number of combinations of genes that can lead to development of it <clears throat> and then lead to the consequences of it. Having those, having this large database helps us to try to figure out some of those combinations so we can give better data to an individual patient. I do not expect that a patient will walk in and they're gonna, we're gonna be able to say, you're gonna have high blood pressure. We don't expect that. We expect that we can say, you're in the highest risk group for it versus the moderate risk group for it versus the lowest risk group. I think that's what the most likely practical application will come over the course of the next decade from this. 
So here's, here's, here's my hope. So number one is what you will get, and it's, there's actually paying for this. If you end up getting a stent put in, for example, there for your heart, there are, there's drugs that work with certain people and drugs that work with other people. They're actually paying for testing for that. And so you may have a better chance of keeping that stent by, ha by having that test than you don't. But here's my hope. So if you look at Mobile, Alabama right now, and you go to up by Country Club, somebody born up by the Country Club can live until they're 83, 85 years old. If you go down to Maysville, they live until they're 65. There's a six miles, there's a 20 year difference in life expectancy at birth. My hope is that we figure out what the cause of that disparity is because it's not, it's not that they're shooting each other. It's not that they're, you know, that they're all drinking themselves to death. There's something going on. And my hope is that we're going to be able to figure that out. And that's why we need to get a diverse group of people to have, to have this testing. Yes, ma'am, my friend. Um, has this program gone and already incorporated information from large studies? Like I know I've heard of Lowland University Health Studies, the longevity. Has that been all already analyzed and put in for their research to start? Or is this all based on individual people putting it in? So the NIH has, and actually now in, in conjunction with uh, Europe in particular, has done a lot of work in combining efforts uh, for many studies that are on, have already been complete. Um, for I'll give you with the study you mentioned, there have been lots of studies that focus a lot on cardiovascular disease. The Jackson Heart Study in Jackson, Mississippi is one with which I've been affiliated, and we have taken that data from those 5,200 individuals and combined it in large groups of trials that had anywhere from 500 to maybe 10,000 people. But when you put all those together, that gets you up to 50 to maybe 100,000 people, nowhere near the million person um, uh, uh, number that we're looking at here. So the, the power of the number is the big piece. Yeah. I think, yes ma'am. You want to take it? Yeah. All right. Repeat your uh, the question is a very specific question about us, what's called HELP syndrome. Um, so preeclampsia is, is what w some women get, usually at the end of pregnancy, that predisposes them to preterm birth and to, and to problems with their, with, their, with their baby around the time of birth. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting disease, and, 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 and you know, there was a saying in uh, medical school, may you never have an interesting disease, um, in, that, in that it turns out that, ma that, turns out the genetics of, of pregnancy are very weird. You've got something growing inside of you that is not genetically you. And how your body separates that is a is a is a is a is a miracle. It's it's the soul coming down from uh, from heaven, but every now and again your body doesn't, and and preeclampsia and help is uh, is in the spectrum of preeclampsia, is where the body starts to see the pregnancy is not self, and develops antibodies towards the pregnancy that that affect other parts of the body. Dr. Crook is an expert in kidneys, and and the kidneys are the first affected. And you can, and he can add some some detail. And HELP syndrome is where it's, it affects a lot of other organs as well. It affects the liver. It affects um, it affects the 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 uh, blood product. You know, your blood. It affects a lot of other um, of other uh, things as well. And the only way to to fix it is to get the thing that's not self out of the mom, which means delivering the baby early. And I'm gonna see if Errol has anything to add. Actually, I thought that was a great explanation, and I don't have anything to add. <laughs> <laughs> you still have a perplexed look, and we all, and I can tell you, we all do also. <laughs> so there, that's one of those situations where, like preeclampsia, which is the prodrome, there are clearly 
factors that put a mom, a pregnant woman, at higher risk for having preeclampsia. And therefore, we need to do things to monitor that pregnancy more closely than we would others. Um, and there are some trials that have been done to talk about things to try to prevent it from occurring. But at this point, we don't have that magic bullet to say, this is specifically what the culprit is and this is how we deal with it, other than delivery. Now, were subsequent pregnancies also? Well, again. No. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> it would be higher risk, but not 100%. A subsequent pregnancy with a different father no. would be, well, I'm just saying, would be less because of the genetics, but it's not, but, but, but I think the recurrence rate for help, now for help may be a little bit higher, for help's a lot higher, I, I suspect. For preeclampsia itself, the recurrence rate is maybe 5%, so 95% chance of having a perfectly normal pregnancy after having a, 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 a bout with preeclampsia. Help is a little bit higher. So, but again, but it's, it's because the mom's recognizing that she's got something growing inside of her that's not her. Is the, is, the, is, the, is the overall cause. I have a question about the All of Us program. Um, I'm only not familiar with the procedure of treatment. So my question then is, is what, what is being done um, to, to in terms of ethics to make sure that the Black communities feel comfortable with doing this? Appreciate that question. The question is uh, centered around issues of research ethics and our state's history with Tuskegee and what's being done to make sure that all participating communities are comfortable. Um, so understanding that uh, legacy in this country and understanding uh, that we're talking about a really sensitive issue of getting genetic information on everybody and getting health information right out of your electronic health record. Uh, those things have been dealt with upfront before anybody was enrolled and uh, continue ongoing. And we're doing it through a process we call community engagement, where uh, we have a very diverse group of participants in the study, community leaders, um, and other noted for, uh, people that would be designated as uh, speakers to, on behalf of the community are part of local efforts, regional efforts, and national efforts to answer those questions, to advocate for participants, to hold all of us investigators' feet to the fire to make sure that we are doing what we're supposed to do and, and listening appropriately. And we are in the early stages of recruitment here. We actually have identified folks who will be uh, representing us at a regional level. level. So we are in a region that's with Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And that group is are now uh, meeting, and we'll be having representatives from that group go to a national level uh, so that those, all of those concerns from all groups across the country are heard and addressed. Great question, appreciate that question. Well, we're, again, we appreciate you sharing your uh, middle of the day with us. Um, we appreciate you coming to USA Health and supporting us. We, if you have questions you'd like to ask independently, we'll be here for a few minutes after. And I'd like you to enjoy the rest of your day and come by our, our uh, desk.